Yo, I'm Matt Forio, and this is Chisel This. Sounded like for a second somebody said Chisel's sick. Oh yeah, cause I'm sick. But I'm still doing this anyway. Am I sick or am I cosplaying as Rudolph? You decide. I don't care. We're here and we're gonna analyze another epic rap battles of history. The penultimate rap battle of season five, it's Teddy Roosevelt versus Winston Churchill. I've been struggling over the last week or so to find out how to exactly put in words the sheer power and quality of this rap battle. That's because three-fourths of me sees this as one of the best ERBs of all time, and a fourth of me says, well, this part could have been better, and that part could have been better. So we're gonna walk through this rap battle and see what stands out and what was left out. Now, this is a battle between two badasses, and the ERB mold tends to exaggerate and exacerbate badassery in the most beautiful way possible. Think of these two men back in the 20th century, making decisions single-handedly for the entire country. In time of war, the vigor and demeanors that they carry emphasize this feeling of strength and bravery that is really unseen in our century. And as a character, when you're self-aware of your presence, you can advertise this jovial facade with sarcastic mannerisms. And this is exactly what Epic Lloyd does with his character, and what I can safely describe as his best and most comfortable role yet. You see, Roosevelt is epicized by the series. You know, he didn't actually have that tough and scruff voice, but they make him sound like this strong man for comedic effect, and the strong man is consistent throughout the entire video. As an actor, Lloyd rides this emotional roller coaster with three main demeanors. First is the pompous man who carries his strength and his smile. It's that facade of friendliness I was talking about. Second is the hard, no-nonsense commander who doesn't even know how to pronounce the word defeat. And third is that goofy and outrageous ERB trademark character that turns certain segments of this battle into an homage to the series, basically classifying Roosevelt as their official mascot. It's amazing to see Lloyd have such a grip on this character to the point where every single facial expression is meticulously crafted. Imagine an animator delicately drawing facial expressions in the utmost scientific way to represent emotion. Lloyd creates that image live with his face for the camera, yielding the perfect character to represent epic rap battles of history. Now, I don't want to leave Danbull out of the praise either. Danbull makes video game rap, so do I to a certain extent. There's a lot we have in common, a lot of ways that we're different from each other. I admire his talent and his lyrical ability to kind of skewer a rhyme scheme and just decorate it with the best kinds of fruits and vegetables. <laughs> But he consistently nailed that jaw defect and minor lisp that plagued the real Winston Churchill. He also maintains a fat cheek and a quivering lip in times of struggle. Since the real Winston Churchill had a bad speech impediment, Danbull does the best he can, going far enough with his voice to stay true to that, but restraining it enough to make the rap battle enjoyable and easy to listen to. They do the best they can to transform Dan into a man with no other distinct facial features besides that, but they give him this cigar and they kind of give him the old man facial cosmetics to make up for it. Both characters are situated in unique looking worlds. It's not just the generic background. You have the gears representing the industrial movement that Roosevelt contributed to. I don't know whose idea it was to incorporate the face of the Big Ben clock in Churchill's background, but it's aesthetically gorgeous. See, it's not really in the background, rather it's superimposed in the foreground of a London street. And the rain with the thunder implies the horrid dark times that Churchill led Britain through. Every time lightning strikes, you're reminded of the clock ticking. Time is the enemy of the man who needs it most, but a friend to the man who forgets it exists. Matt Forio, 2017. So many layers of epic here, I really, I just can't take it. Now let's talk about how they constructed this rap battle. Back in September, I knew they were going to make this matchup, and I ultimately knew that it had to be Lloyd and Dan's brain baby together. I was really excited to see it happen, so I did jot down a quick wish list to send off to Nice Peter. One, Winston can say, when standing on Churchill, as a corruption of his name. It's like, you can actually stand on a hill, like, I always imagined a church being on a hill for some reason, it was just the imagery I was coming up with. Churchill also wins tons, wins tons, tons being a British term. Two, definitely need a teddy bear joke, maybe incorporate Build-A-Bear as a foundation for that. Three, trust busting nut buster. Four, parodying the bull moose party by saying bull S word. 
I don't curse on this show, but you know what I mean, and I'll be using BS to suggest that term. In fact, Nice Peter did reply to that request with this quote, throw the full weight of my wit against your bull moose bull S word. That line, of course, did not make the final cut, but we'll get to how they incorporated bulls later on. And my top request, this matchup capitalizes on their quartet of Rushmore rappers. Every single president depicted on Mount Rushmore has appeared in an epic rap battle of history at this point now. So I definitely suggest that they do something fun with all four of them because they have footage of them. And if you actually take a look at the behind the scenes, you'll see that they had Dante body acting and they superimposed previously recorded faces of Jefferson and Washington at least. I think Lincoln was himself. The way that they turned Rushmore into a band and you have all the previous rappers playing instruments is just one of the many inside jokes that makes this video both an epic rap battle of history and an epic rap battle of history. Now I knew that there was much more work to be done than just that and I was excited to eventually see what they come up with. In fact, this was the first episode of ERB This Wave that I had not heard a demo for prior to the video getting uploaded. So I watched this with totally fresh eyes. And the one thing that struck me was how well they captured the insider knowledge of both parties. A matchup like this can get tough because you have to understand how these two countries felt towards each other and how they treated each other during this time period. And you have to be able to anticipate how they did or would react to world events. What was their mindset? You know, a general look inside of history shows us what happened, but what can we do to find out how they felt about it? Well, you can read autobiographies, you can read quotes, but how do you grasp that terminology that just isn't in the common knowledge? And how do we ascertain the same level of cultural knowledge as someone who lived in that time? Sure, 40 years from now, we'll be able to say what the trends were at our period of time, and we're able to recall how we feel, but how can these people recall how dead people felt. Well, I think actually bringing an English person over to the US to help write this rap battle facilitates that sense of cultural inclusion. There are so many examples of this, and just to describe one, I'll go over the last segment of the rap battle. A bullet can't stop the ball of moose! TR will give WC the full tooth! Not only is WC Winston Churchill's initials, but WC is an old English acronym for water closet, or a place where you can use the toilet. A full deuce, of course, refers to going number two, but in England, a backhanded peace sign, which you see Teddy Roosevelt use in the rap battle, otherwise known as a deuce, meaning two, is like the equivalent of an American middle finger. This also mocks Churchill's famous use of the front words peace sign as a victory symbol, the V sign. Unfortunately, as you will see come my analysis, there are some opportunities I think that they missed. For example, Churchill rebuttals with a verbal deuce chucked back at Teddy. But I wish he would have given that signature V sign in return, because you have Teddy's, and then you literally flip it back on him. This would complement the words that he literally says, throwing the deuce back at him. Nonetheless, these are awesome layers of inside knowledge, but I will point out missed opportunities where I see them. You know, I didn't influence this battle, but it's interesting to think how multiple minds fill the tiny gaps of others during a group project. And I would love to see exactly how each piece of the cast of ERB fills those holes together. There's too much here to come from one mind, and everybody knows that. But it's really interesting to see how many diverse minds can come together to make something culturally diverse that appeals to so many people. Most of these culture intensive references are like backwards research. Like you would have to know it first before you dug in deeper. For starters, who is the genius on Rap Genius that decided to connect WC to Water Closet? And more importantly, who is the bigger genius for knowing the connection enough to write that in the first place? There's a lot of this in this rap battle. Let's walk through it in chronological order now. Boy, a challenge! I love competition! Now where would I mount the stuffed head of a Winston? Bully! This is the first of many Dan Bull incidental references in this rap battle. Bully! A bullet! A bullet! Ball moose! This is also the first of three references to Mount Rushmore, where Teddy compares mounting animals with his hunting skills and mounting faces like his face on Mount Rushmore. Teddy says this at the very beginning to assert that he's already won. And the real question would be rather where is he going to mount the stuffed head, not how is he going to kill his opponent. Just to add more beef to the diss, I would have rephrased it a little bit as such. Now, what can I mount this stuffed head of a wince in? You would keep the same meaning, 
but be able to add more disses by calling Winston a wince. And I think the first step to creating wordplay is breaking apart the separate parts of a name and finding which parts of the words mean something different when isolated. I'm into fitness, digging ditches through a lispus, rough riding down a cuba line. What's up, bitches? Of course, ERB finally plays their own game and capitalizes on what they've been hinting at for the better part of four years. What's up, bitches? What's up, bitches? What's up, bitches? Teddy. Teddy. What's up, bitches? What's up, bitches? You know what? I'm just very happy that they took the initiative to break the fourth wall more. It's almost like they've come out of their shell a little bit and sprinkled a little bit of everything they've ever done into this one rap battle. Hmm. I keep my rhymes pure like my food and drugs. I'm an American stock, and you're the British Alma I mean, for Christ's sake, look at that. At least grow a spruce mustache and cover part of it up! I guess it's an American thing to boast facial hair. I mean, I can't grow any, but I'm as American as anybody. And Teddy uses that as an indicator of manhood. It's clear to see why they thought drawing this comparison was necessary. For the second reference to Mount Rushmore, Teddy poses himself in the same position he was carved in. And it also gives way to admiring that spruce mustache. You know, spruce is a kind of tree, so it makes it look and sound like Teddy can literally grow a tree on his face while Winston can't grow any facial hair. Manlyhood makes for a lot of humorous behavior. And let's face it, you're not all that great. You tossed away lives in Gallipoli like there were scraps off your plate. Now Teddy gets into some hardcore evidence of why he's better than Churchill. One thing I would have done is changed tossed away to picked off. I mean, they virtually insinuate the same thing. However, picked off fits better with the dinner plate analogy because rather picky people like to pick off food from their plate in the same way that they're insinuating Churchill picked off lives. The line already gives this message, but you have those minor changes that can add layers to the lyrics if you find them. In fact, I tried suggesting some of this in the Charles Darwin rap battle that didn't make the cut. Some stuff that Peter liked, some stuff that Peter thought was unnecessary, but I know that sometimes they just go with whatever sounds the best and still gives the same message. The whole miserable country is the size of one state! Something I noticed when briefing the rap genius page on this rap battle is that they picked Alabama specifically to represent the UK in size because they're literally almost the exact same size in square miles. And to those that think that complaining about the size of the UK is an invalid diss, well, that's Churchill's to prove, isn't it? That's the way a rap battle works. You know, one party can exaggerate something even if it's untrue. You can do this when you're making a random argument. It's your opponent's job to refute that and prove that it holds no water. And that's what makes the opponent win the rap battle. You see, the way this works is that you're incentivized to not make claims that you can't back up. So if Teddy's gonna take a risk and go for that diss, saying that the size of the UK is something worthy of being dissed about, he has to be able to defend it. And whenever you're writing something, you have to be able to defend whatever you write. This is something you'll learn in the next tutorial episode of Chisel This, which is about storytelling, you'll find that the art of rapping and the art of making arguments are very similar. They can see my way to running that without donning my pants neck! This is a good way to show humility by bringing up Teddy's own imbalances. Being partially blind, he uses the rather interesting sounding name of his glasses as part of a rhyme scheme. Go toe to toe with me, you bloated drunk old man! Why don't you toasty go on over to a 12 step problem? Churchill indulged in a lot of alcohol alcoholic vices, and of course this is necessary to bring up. And when they say 12-step program, it not only references the steps taken to recover from addiction, but it sounds like something involved in one of those old acts or old government programs where the solutions would propose a certain amount of steps that you would promise your constituency to execute. I must have trust fund lush with my American muscle to walk softly over here and give my big stick a suckle! Again, using American patriotism as a tool for humor. Teddy paints himself as the strong man against the brittle and fail people overseas, parodying his famous quote, speak softly and carry a big stick and you'll go far. He pretends the stick is his penis, obviously. But the fun part of the line is how they make up the word suckles and have the character say it while he's proudly pissing himself. You have defining elements of a character here. And that is a huge one and it's so memorable. This attitude, when juxtaposed with his opponent, makes Churchill seem so much more dark and serious. And that shift is such a key element in the emotional roller coaster that ERB is the architect of. I'm very happy with this rap battle so far. But just to mention another thing that I came up with while thinking about it, Teddy could have also said, if you speak softly, 
my big stick will go very far up your, you know what. Pass me a cigar and a large glass of brandy. I'm about to take you up prematurely, like your family. We have a really good introduction to the character of Churchill, who is self-aware of his power in a different way. You see, while Teddy laughs off his pride, Churchill uses the cigar and the alcohol as a visual weapon. It's almost cool in this era to indulge in vices, and he does so in a manner that is demonstrative of free will and facing risks head on. This is the vibe that I get from his nonchalant attitude towards substance abuse. He's too powerful in his own mind to succumb to the dangers of smoking or drinking, so he wears that as a symbol of pride. That's the attitude of these men back in the day. And I mean, you see it as clear as day in this rap battle. I am the Rhyme Minister, fresh in a hat and dinner jacket. You look like a mix of Epic Lloyd and a Pringle Packet. He's the Rhyme Minister. Pretty awesome play on words, right? But where is the proof? Okay, he rhymes fresh in a hat and dinner jacket. And then at the end, he rhymes a Pringles packet. So you have three main rhymes there. Not bad, but what if you were to capitalize on this claim by rhyming rhyme minister? I think that that compound word has a lot of options for rhyming. Just as an example, I just came up with this on the top of my head. I'm the rhyme minister, blimey, time's ticking, sir. You might think that Teddy wins tons, but I Winston will. I kind of wrote that in the British accent that I don't have, so you get the idea. There's a lot of different ways that you write depending on the accent that you have. But then we leave out the second fourth wall break, where Churchill name drops the actor playing Teddy. You look like a mix of Epic Lloyd and a Pringles packet. I personally think it's fine only because of the precedent that we've already set. This is a role that Lloyd's been dying to play for years, and it's a role that the fan community has been dying to see him play for years. It's kind of his staple role. It's his own personality with the hair and the mustache slapped onto it. And that's literally what Dan Bull points out here. Since we've already directly referenced the series, it leaves room for justification of anything else that might. And there is more, you see it with Rushmore. Like I said earlier, this rap battle does it all for some reason. I was saving the planet from an axis of darkness while you were back home opening national parks. Yeah. Now Winston reflects Teddy's direction on announcing why he's better than his opponent. And he makes a good comparison to belittle him. I've never been a fan of adding an appendage onto the end of a line to force a rhyme. I was saving the planet from an axis of darkness while you were back home opening national parks. Yeah. Now listen, I admire Dan Bull's lyrical talent. And in some ways you can commend him for finding a way to make darkness rhyme with parks, yes. Or maybe Maybe it wasn't even him, I don't know. But it's not something I'm particularly fond of, just to put that out there. Let's put it this way. I've seen way worse examples of people doing that over the last few years being a part of this community. And I think that this rap battle justifies it a bit better by adding another character on the screen who says it. Instead of having one character trying to pretend that darkness rhymes with some word called Parks Yes. You see, there's no reason for the one iteration of Churchill to be saying yes in that sequence. It, it makes sense to have another person pop up walking by and kind of like the main rapper Churchill just ended his sentence with Parks and a secondary Churchill supporting character in the backdrop agreed, yes. So there's a the justification for it. But when I don't particularly like something, I want to tell you because I have a reason why. You were born asthmatic, you're going to choke hard while I wake up every day and chain smoke cigar. In the same way Teddy mocked Winston's appearance and manhood, Winston finds an advantage that he has in the same field. He uses Teddy's asthmatic past as a crutch, in the same way that Teddy used Winston's bare face as a crutch. I'll fight you on the beaches, I'll fight you on the beaches. Yes. Any way you want to fight, I'll fight you and I'll beat you. See? I think these three lines start off really powerful. You have a reference to a quote made in a speech, and the second line is classic Dan Bull homophonic wordplay. But I just don't see what the third line is supposed to do on a greater scale. You know, there might be a problem when a line literally has no annotation on Rap Genius, when there was nothing more to clarify about it. Let's go through it really quick. The first line takes a quote and says where he will fight Teddy. The second line parodies that quote with similar sounding words consistent with rap terminology. The third line merely wraps up the accusation that he can fight Teddy anywhere and still win. But I think that's a given by the time we reach that second line. I think that message was already stated. But to replace that whole third line itself, I might say, I'll fight you on the beaches. I'll fight you on the beats. Yes, any way you want. I can impede you with my speeches. That would use a personal impairment as an advantage. In the same way that Teddy used a lack of sight, Churchill can use his speech impediment. Because while he did have a slight speech impediment, his speeches 
or powerful. They delivered a message to people. At this point, I'm just performing microsurgery on the lyrics, but at this point, of course, the concepts as a whole are intact. I might be battling you even though I'm toasted, but tomorrow I'll be sober and you'll still be roasted. This takes from another quote that Churchill once said, and the quote in itself is really a great way to make fun of somebody. The original quote was, somebody said, Winston, you are drunk, and what's more, you are disgustingly drunk. And Churchill said, Bessie, my dear, you are ugly, and what's more, you are disgustingly ugly. But tomorrow, I shall be sober, and you will still be disgustingly ugly. The concept is funny because it accepts impairment for both parties, but then it clarifies the individual's impairment as ephemeral and self-afflicted, something that you can control, whereas the opponent suffers permanent fault, something irreparable without a cure. Of course, they format it into rap lingo and boom. It's powerful, it's, it's so witty. I mean, you have to have the mind. What kind of mind do you have to have to come up with something like that as a rebuttal? The sheer audacity of these men. If you don't admire the strength, even if you don't agree with them, admire the strength and the commitment they made to their country. It's just fascinating. It really is. My parents died when they were young and it was morbid, but at least they didn't ditch me when they were alive like yours did. See, Teddy usurps the family diss by just coming out and saying it. In fact, looking at it by itself, Teddy's parents dying is not a character flaw. Sure, it's an event that led to sorrow, but I don't see where it defines his character. Winston Churchill's parents being mostly absent for his life would surely affect his character. Teddy's parents dying was involuntary, and Churchill's parents abandoning him was a conscious choice. There's much more of a character flaw on Churchill's side than Teddy's side. Bottom line, Make sure you don't leave yourself susceptible to an even harsher rebuttal diss when you're making a diss of your own. Oh shit, World War too soon. Too soon. Well, Teddy is dropping bombs, so you best go hiding you too. Here comes the strong man again, and they even recreate one of Teddy's photos. You can see there's a lot of care to the character here. Another example of the cultural insider is the term tube. Someone pointed out on the rap genius that the tube is the colloquial term for the London Metro, where citizens hid during the Nazi Blitzkrieg. He then segues into more evidence-based disses. You should be ashamed of your military honor! Everyone knows you're back at home like, thank God for Pearl Harbor! The US wasn't involved in the war until Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. Britain, quite frankly, needed the United States in the war to support the Allies. Teddy exaggerates this unsavory fact by using it as just another example of why Churchill wasn't strong enough on his own. Now, Teddy has that high ground, and he slips back into his happy strongman before Churchill has a chance to respond. Don't worry! The U.S. will give you a pass. Just change your poster to keep calm and kiss my cousin's ass. It's the classic superiors argument where they accuse you of doing something and then absolve you of your sins before you even have the chance to prove your innocence because they can't make an argument back, by the way. But it's funny because the U.S. did give Winston Churchill a pass to be a citizen. He was the first person to ever become an honorary citizen of the United States. One condition for U.S. backing down on Britain, it's another diss. There's two meanings for cousin here. One is America being a cousin to Britain, and the other is Franklin Delano Roosevelt being a cousin to Theodore Roosevelt. FDR and Churchill were quite close because they were both world leaders on the same stage together at the same time. But since Teddy was president, way before Churchill was prime minister, there is some seniority to brag about. This doesn't bother Churchill. Teddy there, I don't think it's very fair for a British bulldog to melee with a teddy bear. He comes right back by projecting a childish image on the senior Teddy Roosevelt with some signature rhyming, of course. You're no man, you're an overgrown boy scout. I should stuff you in a pram just so you can throw your toys out. This continues with the boy scout accusations and the British idioms involving prams or strollers. Dan Dan even does the resting, angry face that Churchill has in a lot of his pictures. This part remains consistent in reminding Teddy that even though he was around earlier and led a larger country, Churchill can match that playing field easily without trepidation. Continuing the streak of embarrassment. They put your fat head on a mountain to save face, but if Rushmore was a band, then you play bass. Churchill suggests that the United States decided to put Teddy on Mount Rushmore as compensation to him for humiliating America. Saving face, you know, face mountain. To be clear, he didn't actually have to humiliate anything for Churchill to make the accusation. It's a hyperbole, it's imagery what a rap battle is for. I know bass is an important instrument, but people like to joke about it being the least important instrument in a band. Of course, they only included this line as an excuse to, 
bring the band back together as I had wished they would. Here we have signature damn bull rhyming. And these words don't necessarily have to do anything for the story, they just sound good. I feel like this battle was way less heavy on Dan Bull's lyricism than Jack the Ripper was. And I feel like this might have been his hard effort to squeeze in some of his own style before the battle ended. And look at this menacing, menacing man. This puts the epic in ERB. A bullet to the chest won't stop you, my words will. See, this is a really powerful sentiment because at this point, Churchill has an understanding of how Teddy is really the strong man. He gets shot during a speech, continues giving the speech. What can stop him? Churchill acknowledges that, but proposes something even deadlier than any weapon. His own words of wisdom, guidance, and leadership. However, a bullet can't stop the ball of moose! Tiara will give double, you see, the full two. Whatever shit you throw at me, I'll just return to sender! I'll battle to the end and I will never surrender! They tie bull to both bullet and bull moose. And Dan Bull. This also works as a metaphor for hunting, seeing that Teddy was a hunter and you use bullets to shoot down animals such as moose. I've already explained the meaning of the lyrics earlier in the video, but the visuals here are just stunning. With the decision to film at a higher speed, to slow the frame rate but maintain the mouth movement. This sends you into a time portal of what it would actually look like if a recording of that moment in time were actually taken. Yet again making the two men connect on more than just a lyrical level. Perfect characters, fourth wall breaks, a catered instrumental, a cinematic sequence, cameos from older rap battles bringing it all full circle, characters feeling like they're actually interacting with each other. This rap battle really had it all and there's just one battle left of this season. Time to wonder if my earlier prediction from May should come true. And just so you know, I'm calling this right now. Season five opened with a closed book. Season five will end with a closed book. For now, expect more raps and more tutorials from me in 2017, as well as an album. And look forward to the season finale, because I haven't heard a demo or anything. I barely know anything about it. I'm looking forward to it just like you are. I'm Matt Forio, and that's all for you today.